With his wife, Marjorie, giving weather reports from their base in Chalmera, Ecuador, Nate Saint had piloted several flights over Alca territory, dropping gifts and looking for a possible landing site. Then in January of 1956, Nate and four other missionaries landed at Palm Beach for their first face-to-face -face meeting with the violent Alcas, a feared Stone Age tribe whose previous contacts with the outside world had ended in death. For Nate Saint, Ed McCulley, Roger Udarian, Jim Elliott, and Peter Fleming, it was an answer to months of prayer when three Alcas, two women and a man, stepped out of the jungle and spent the day with them, sharing food and making spirited attempts to communicate. By morning of the next day, all three had left, but a quick flight over the jungle showed Nate that a party of ten Alcas were on their way to the river. Nate radioed his wife. Looks like they'll be here for the Sunday afternoon service. He promised to report back at 4.30, but the report never came. Instead, four days later, a search party found the bodies of the missionaries, victims of a brutal spearing attack. Among those receiving the tragic news was Steve Saint, the five-year-old son of Nate. But today, his father's killers are not his enemies, Instead, they are his brothers, his sisters, his friends. God's trail has taken Steve back to live in Ecuador as a member of the tribe. Steve's journey in the footsteps of his father is the subject of this Venture in Faith. Good News Productions International presents Venture in Faith. inspiring testimonies from Christians of all ages, telling how God has worked in their lives. Our special guest today is Steve Saint. His father, Nate, Nate Saint, is one of the most famous martyrs of this century. You may not be aware of the fact that there have been more martyrs for Christ in this century than in all previous 19 centuries combined. Steve and I were just visiting about five faithful missionaries with New Tribes Missions who were martyred in South America, and a book was written about them called God Planted Five Seeds. But somehow God in His infinite wisdom did not make those martyrs famous. But on January the 8th, 1956, five men died in the jungles of Ecuador on a little beach called by Steve's father, uh, Palm Beach. They died there, and the world knows about their story. Steve, you were only five years old when your father was speared to death. Tell us what you remember about that event. Boys, I can't really remember what I remember and what I've learned since then. Um, but uh, I have recollection of mom coming and telling us that, uh, that our dad wasn't coming home. I remember the occasion because there were lots of other families. The, um, I think the McCulleys were there and I think that the Udarians were there. Um, and I think Aunt Olive Fleming was there. And, um, a couple of the other families were out in Arahuno, but there were lots of friends around, and then people came down from Quito, and it was always kind of exciting when people came to our house. So I remember that there was a feeling of excitement. What I don't remember is I don't remember sadness. I don't remember um, any of the adults agonizing over something terrible that had happened. And uh, my mother has said that when she told Kathy and Phil and myself that Dad wasn't coming home, um, Kathy wanted to know where he had gone. And uh, Mom said that he had gone to heaven. And she said that I said, oh, I know why he went ahead, because he loved Jesus more. I don't think that was the case, but um, I do have some recollections, but not an awful lot. I was only five. 
And uh, tell us about how Christ came to the Alka people whom your father wanted to evangelize. Well, the, uh, the Waurani, as they're called, they're, they're known to the outside world as Aukas, which is really a derogatory term that means savages or naked, naked ones. Uh, their name for themselves is the people, Waurani. Um, the Waurani had lived really a violent existence, probably the most egalitarian people on earth. Just no rules, no law, no chief, no elders, just everybody did exactly what they wanted to do and what they thought was best. Um, and this had led to lots of killings within the tribe. I mean, uh, Washington Post recently had an article on the Waurani titled, The Most Murderous Tribe on Earth. And they killed not only amongst themselves, but they also killed outsiders whenever they had contact or when they needed an axe or a machete. They would go out and actually kill people to get axes and machetes. But um, after Dad and his friends were killed in 1956, uh, two women, a uh, wife and a sister of one of the men, Gikita, old grandfather Gikita, who had led the uh, killing party, they got tired of all the killing and decided to take their chances in the outside world. And they went out to Quechua territory, another Indian tribe, and they weren't killed. And when they got out there, they found out that Dayuma, a young girl who had fled from killings in the tribe years before, was still alive. They got together and they invited her to come back with them into the tribe. And then they returned just a, a week later with an invitation from my Aunt Rachel my dad's older sister, and uh, Betty Elliott, or Elizabeth Elliott, uh, Jim Elliott's wife, he had been one of the other men that was killed with dad, to go in and live with the Waurani. Um, they, they went in, in in 1958, and they were the, really the ones that took the gospel to the, um, or what the Waurani call God's carvings to the people. And so your mother was a widow, uh, your father was the oldest of the five martyrs, That's as right. I recall. Mm -hmm. Your mother's a widow. Did you stay there in the jungle for any period of time? We stayed in Shell, the little base on the edge of the jungles that Dad had built for Mission Aviation Fellowship, the organization that he and Mom were with. And after Dad was killed, we stayed there in Shell for a year and then came back um, to the States on furlough for a year. But Mom really felt that the call that God had given to her and dad wasn't relinquished because of dad's death and so she went back down and worked as a nurse in a mission hospital and uh, ran a guest house and that's where I grew up down there in Ecuador. Uh, I remember reading in an article condensed from Decision Magazine that you were baptized by the men who had killed your father. Kind of lead up to that and tell us how it happened. Well, Boyce, after um, after Aunt Rachel had been living in the, in, with the Waurani for several years, uh, with Dayuma, uh, Betty stayed for a couple of years, and then she and Valerie left and, and came back to the States. Um, Dayuma wanted her son, Sam, who, whose father was Quechua, to come in and live with the tribe. But in their custom and in their culture, it's the responsibility of the sons of anybody who has been killed to avenge those deaths. So Aunt Rachel and Dayuma weren't really sure if it was a good idea for Sam to come in. And they finally decided, well, let's bring Sam in, but let's bring Steve in too. And so I guess at about 10, 12 years of age, Sam and I went in to visit the Waurani. And that was, that was my first contact with them about three years after um, Aunt Rachel had gone in to live with them. And uh, I spent vacations and Christmas vacations uh, with Aunt Rachel. Loved living in the jungles with her and with the Waurani. And then uh, when I was about, I guess I was 12, my sister was going away to boarding school and she wanted to be baptized. And uh, mom said, who would you like to baptize you? You know, it'd be a good idea if it was somebody that you respect as a spiritual leader in your life. And Kathy right away said, I want chemo to baptize me. And uh, so she came out to be baptized, and, and I thought, you know, I, sh I should be baptized too. 
didn't think anything about it. It just seemed natural to be baptized out there where I was already in the jungles. And uh, Kimo and Dewey, two of the elders in the fledgling Waurani church, said that they would baptize us. And uh, we also, mom had wanted to go see where Palm Beach was, where dad had died. So we decided to just combine it and we made a trek from Tiweno, where Aunt Rachel was living, over on the Tiwena River. We went over a ridge about a day's journey to the Kurarai River, or what they call the Ewenguno, and uh, to visit Palm Beach. And then Kimo and Dewey baptized Kathy and myself along with two uh, Waurani young people there. And uh, your father and the other martyrs are buried there? Yes, although they were just buried in a common grave. Um, when the rescue party came in or the search party came in, their bodies had already been in the river for several days and um, in the hot jungles, you know, they were badly deteriorated, decomposed already. And so they just buried them all together in a common grave. And uh, the Waurani had marked the grave and the marker was still there. So we had a little prayer service around the grave. And uh, I remember Kimo praying and he just said, Father God, Warepo, years ago we came here to do a bad thing because our hearts were dark with sin. But he said, now we've come to do a good thing. Look well on what we're doing here today. Is he the man who just recently passed away? No, that was Gikita. Kimo and uh, Dewey are still living. Are, are still living. Mm -hmm. And uh, just recently, I understand the fuselage of your father's plane was discovered. You know, isn't that something? Over the years, a number of pilots and people interested in aviation have come to me and said, you know, I think we should go down and try to find the remains of your dad's plane to rebuild it as a monument to what God has done through this story. And I just have always thought that that was just ludicrous. Anybody who's lived in the jungles knows that these these jungle rivers can change from a trickle to a torrent in a matter of an hour. And it just, I mean, we live in the rainforest where it rains 32 feet of rain a year. And uh, I was sure that that little fabric covered plane was nothing but pieces of threads of fiber and rusted little bits of uh, metal strung all the way from the Awenguno through the Amazon basin. But, um, in 1994, my Aunt Rachel came up for um, cancer treatment. And when she got off the plane in Orlando, the first thing that she said when I saw her, she said, I got a call from the jungles this morning before I left, and they said they found your dad's plane. So I jumped on an airplane and went down, and sure enough, they had found a piece of metal sticking out of the um, sand and wondering what it was because there's no metal in the jungles. They pulled on it, this man and his wife, Kawitipe and his wife, and finally dislodged the uh, main fuselage structure where the seats were attached and still had the landing gear on it. In fact, when I got down there, there was still some brake fluid in one of the brake lines. Wow. Now, uh, tell us how you came to be a pilot. Well, it's almost a disease for some of us. Uh, I doubt if an airplane has ever flown over that I haven't looked up to see what it was and uh, I've just always loved airplanes. When I came to college, um, I decided that that would be a good time to actually get my license. I had done some flying before. So I took two hours of instruction and figured out that paying for college and learning to fly were mutually incompatible. So I sold the motorcycle that I had. and started watching ads in the paper and bought an old World War II trainer. And then I just begged um, pilots who had instructor's ratings to give me an hour here and an hour there in exchange for me letting them fly the plane. I got about eight or ten hours and got my brother-in-law, who was headed as a missionary pilot to uh, Mexico, to sign me off and started flying around the Midwest in my old J3 Cub. You know, there's so much to talk about, Steve. We're just going to have to fast forward through a lot of this. But I want our viewers to hear about the story of your matrimony. Well, I, when I was getting out of college, um, I had really 
wasn't sure what I was going to do and was really feeling that I should go back to Ecuador for a while. I, I just didn't want to fall into doing something just because it was the thing to do. And, and at least in theory, I, I believe that God had a plan for each of our lives and that he would tell us if we would ask him. And I had been asking and I just, I, I just didn't know what God wanted me to do. But I wanted to do what God wanted me to do if God wanted me to do something specific. So I decided to go back to Ecuador and um, I had actually thought about getting married before going down, but it was something that I wanted to do and, and I don't think it was really God's plan. And so I left and went to Ecuador sure that I would never, never be married. I want to probe into this thing a little bit because you were pretty serious about one particular young woman and she didn't want to go to a mission field. Well, I think she just didn't feel I think she didn't feel God calling her that way and, and it finally dawned on me, God can't be in conflict with himself and if, and I really felt strongly that, not necessarily that God was leading me to the mission field, but that I needed to be flexible and open to whatever he wanted. I mean, I had grown up bilingual and bicultural and I had a lot of roots, more roots in Ecuador than I had here in the States. And uh, it just didn't seem compatible that God could be leading a young lady to stay here in the States and me to go someplace else and have the two of us intended for each other. So I went to Ecuador and she stayed uh, here and I'm sure that God had a plan in that. But after I'd been in Ecuador for a number of months. But you were resigned to being uh, single the rest of your life, isn't that right? Well, resign might be the word. I thought yeah, I thought, this is it. I'll never get married. Uh, and that wasn't a happy thought for me, but uh, I thought, there's no way I'm ever going to find a wife in Ecuador, and I didn't know if I was ever coming back. I, I really didn't know what the plan was. But I got to Ecuador, and then my younger brother, my stepbrother, my mother was remarried after she'd been a widow for 10 years to a missionary widower, and his son and I were, one of his sons and I were the same age, well, this stepbrother was getting married, and he's younger than I am, and that really made me feel like it'll never happen for me. And then a, a singing group came down from a church in Minnesota, West Central Minnesota, and somebody asked me to be their tour guide down to the jungles. And on that trip, I met a young lady that um, I just fell madly in love with, and. Uh, uh, still am 23 years later and we were we met down there and then were married down there with her parents permission our our oldest son Sean was married down there before we ever came back she had never been outside of the US she'd only been outside of Minnesota a couple times but it was clear that she was willing that whatever wherever God led us that she would go I tell people that I promised her if she'd marry me I'd show her the world and and I have we've We've lived in North America, Central America, South America, Africa, traveled extensively together in the Caribbean. So she's seen at least as much of the world as she'd like to. Now, I want you to tell us how you got into business. Well, that's the other disease I had from the time I was a young boy. I just, my mind always worked in, in business ways, I guess. Um, when I was a young kid, I... I discovered that the sucre and the dollar fluctuated. You know, one day the dollar would be uh, 21, worth 21 sucres and then later it would be worth 19 sucres. And I got to thinking about that and I thought, what if I buy sucres when the dollar is high and then I buy dollars when the uh, sucre is high? And I started doing that and started making a little bit of money and then I discovered that um, I could get big bags of candy and break it down into small bags and sell it to friends and I just started little ways like that but my mind always worked in those ways and I just assumed that you know I'd grow up and be a missionary but I really began to see that God had given me what I think he gives to everybody he doesn't just give us a calling but he he gives he equips us to do what he calls us to do and I really began to feel that God was calling me to business rather than to missions. 
And then I began to realize, you know, hey, not everybody can go. Some people have to send them. And so I decided this is what God wants me to, to do. I started a construction business in Ecuador to support myself while working in orphanages and with missions after college. And then came back when Jenny and I came back and started a construction land development business. And we were quite successful. I heard you say that you had paid uh, taxes up into six figures. Yeah, that's, yes, I've paid lots of taxes. But the Lord has been good. And, and I think, really, it, people would be surprised, but there were times when I made bad decisions using a lot of leverage, and uh, which I learned to do early on, um, but took on a lot of debt. And then I saw in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, and well, throughout the Bible, it talks about the dangers of debt, and God kept telling Israel to be a lender but not a borrower, so that they'd be the head and not the tail. And you know, I became convicted that if hey, if God's word is good for salvation, if there's other things in there, and there's a lot about handling of money, that I should do that too. And so, fellows that I was in business with, we decided hey, if that's what God's word says, we should do that. And that happened just before a major recession. And uh, to say that, to say that God really has been uh, good to me. We've missed some of the bullets that a lot of people, or a lot of the traps that people fall into. But uh, I really give credit to the Lord. I think the Lord has, has intended it for a purpose. But now, as of uh, the recent past, you're no longer in business. Tell us how that happened. Well, that and my, my call to go to Ecuador um, really came at just about the same time. Uh, Jenny and I had, had an opportunity to either buy out I was in a heavy, heavy equipment uh, construction materials mining business with big drag lines and bulldozers and equipment like that in central Florida. And um, we were faced with either needing, needing to sell out, I was a 50% owner, either needing to sell out or, or buy the rest of the business. And uh, we just put it to the Lord and um, the decision was to sell. And I didn't know what we would do after that. And, and was not looking forward to that. Even though I've started and owned a number of businesses, I just had really felt like this stage in life with kids uh, starting college and in high school that I really wanted to stay in that business. But um, Lord had other plans. And then for a year, almost a year, I looked for other businesses to get into. And boy, the doors just closed so clearly and obviously that I finally said to Jenny, I, you know, I just can't believe this. I've been in business for a long time. Surely I can find something. I said, I'd buy anything, even if, even if it wasn't profitable, just to, you know, just to have something to do. And the uh, Lord's given Jenny some insight. She said, well, maybe God's closing the door. And, you know, somehow that just hadn't occurred to me that maybe God had something else in mind. And finally I just said, God, I am so desperate for something to do. I'm not good at retirement. I, I begged the Lord to show me what He wanted me to do, and I would do it. That's when we went down, or when Aunt Rachel came with the news that Dad's plane had been discovered. And I went down, and while I was down there, the old people in the tribe started coming to me. They knew that Aunt Rachel was sick, and they said, Baba, when, that's what they call me, Baba, when Nemo, Star, what they call Aunt Rachel, when Star dies, then you come and live with us. And um, I had no intention of doing it until they, they made it clear that they really wanted me to come and that it was their decision that I needed to decide whether I wanted to remain part of the family and go visit, uh, go live with them or not. And suddenly it dawned on me, you know, maybe this is what God wants me to do and it just didn't seem practical. I didn't want to. But I told them when they finally said, we say, come, come live here, what do you say? To get them off my back, I would tried every other way. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll ask Wang Lungi, I'll ask the man maker and see. And they immediately said, fine, like they knew something that I didn't. And um, then I felt that I had to be good to my promise. And so I asked the Lord real honestly if he would show me if that's really what he wanted me to do. It didn't seem practical, uh, not a, the best use of my time. and and. Uh, 
skills and training. And the Lord took me from desperately not wanting to just just changed my mind until a month later. I just couldn't th imagine doing anything else but going down to live in the jungles with the Waurani. And in reflecting on it, you were uniquely qualified to do it. Tell us why. Yes, I really didn't know at the time. I, I really thought surely somebody, somebody else who's been involved in missions or like something. Like Moses and Aaron. Yeah, yeah right. There he is, yeah. Lord, send him. Yeah, Lord, this is a great project. Why don't you send Aaron? Um, <laughs> But when I knew that the Lord wanted me to, to do this, is the first thing that I can ever remember doing with no plan. And people would say, well, what are you going to do down there? And I honestly didn't know. All I knew was that the Lord had made it clear to me and to Jenny. I've learned, it's taken me a while to learn that, that God speaks to women too. I don't mean to be a chauvinist, but Jenny was just always very submissive and willing to go. And it took me a long time to learn that you know, if God was leading me someplace and he had clearly led Jenny and me to be together, that he would lead Jenny the same place. And, and even Jenny was convinced that we should go live in the jungles. And I'm not talking in a village in the jungles, to go to a brand new location, no airstrip, no houses, no gardens, no nothing. And um, as I began to contemplate going down there, and as the Lord gave me this uh, desire to go, um, the plan just came just one step at a time to go down and live with the Waurani. And then, and then it became clear that what I needed to do was to go down, not with a plan, but to go down and help them, the believers that had invited me down, to work under them, not as a missionary, but as part of the tribe. Someone told me that David Livingston died trying to open up trade routes in Africa because he realized that if the if there was no business, that the Arab slave traders would continually prey upon Christian villages. Right. And uh, you have a similar dream of allowing the Waodanis to be self-sufficient economically. Well, actually, it, it's really m more a realization of what's necessary. The uh, Waodani asked me to help them with three things. They asked me to help them become medically independent. They asked me to uh, help teach them about the outside world so they would understand because they always came out on the short end of the stick whenever they had contact with, with the outside world. And they wanted me to help protect them or really to help them protect themselves in their own rights, which I thought was their territory primarily, um, their, their children. But when I got down there and began to get involved in these things, it became clear that there were a lot of people that didn't want the Waurani to become independent. You had uh, environmentalists that wanted to use these famous, this famous tribe to further their own ends. There were um, anthropologists that didn't want them to change, wanted, you know, wanted everybody to stay out, wanted to make a a people zoo out of them so they could go down and visit them and study them and then go back to living in their comfortable homes someplace else. Um, and then medicine, you know, the uh, contact with the outside world has brought a lot of diseases that the Waurani weren't used to, but they had problems of their own, medical problems, which weren't so bad before they knew that there was medicine, but once they realized that there was medicine that could take care of these problems, like malaria is a big one, or, or parasites, um, worms, amoebas, then not to have the medicine when they knew it was, it was there and it could cure them really became a hardship. So that's what I went down to do. But after working on that for a while, I, 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 mean, I came to the realization that these are good things, but these are a means, these are not the end. That the, that the purpose, the only legitimate purpose for me, even though they consider me part of the tribe, I still was part of another culture too. I realized that the only legitimate reason for me to be there was to help them to reestablish their church. And I don't mean that there was anything wrong with doing these other things, but that, that had to be my purpose. And that really was their purpose as believers for doing whatever they did. And uh, I began to think about that and began to search the scriptures and 
and came to the conclusion, which is the same conclusion people have come to for years, that the purpose of missions is not primarily evangelism, it's not a lot of the other activities. Those are means to planning the indigenous church. That means to planning a church that is autonomous within every nation, tribe, and tongue so that they then can carry out the purpose that God has given them as believers to share his gospel with their people. But to have a truly indigenous church, it's got to be self-propagating. They've got to be able to evangelize. But it's also got to be self-supporting. No independent Waurani church will ever be able to receive its funding from North America. And we see that happening in, in places like Haiti, places that have been have received lots of attention from outside. It's very hard to help people materially for very long without creating independence. And then it also had to be self-governing. And now the Waurani, from the time they first heard the gospel, there have been people who understood and, and really adopted the gospel and, and accepted Christ as their Savior and Lord. And, and they could share that with other people, but they have no economy no trade goods, they're, they're not on any roads. Um, so to be able to support their church and to be able to buy medicines for the sick people in the tribe that needed it and to be able to tend to them, they needed some kind of an economy. So we've been working on that. And then uh, we've also been working on helping them learn to protect their interest, which part of it was to protect their territory, but we also found that there are lots of there are leftist organizations that are down there that that prey on people like this, and they get to the young people and then get the young people in positions of political power, and then use them to uh, take advantage and use the tribes. So um, I began to realize that in doing those things that I was going to be going against some people that in fairly high places uh, politically that had interest in maintaining the Waurani as dependents. And that's where I realized that, that the Lord had called me for a reason. I'm an Ecuadorian citizen. I was born and raised in Ecuador. Um, the Waurani, in their culture, you belong if your father is buried there. And my father is buried there and my mother, not my real mother, my aunt, but they, they call aunt her Rachel. my mother. <laughs> She's buried there, and, and all the old people have told me, your father, is, your father died here, we say you should die here. I kept telling them, in our culture, you should be more specific about when that should happen. <laughs> you know, one of the ways that you're helping the Waldani people is by having tours of North Americans come down and visit them. I want you to tell our viewers about uh, something happened just very recently, what, a couple of weeks ago? Right. Uh, tell us about that, and in particular, Steve, I want you to tell our viewers about the power of the gospel to literally make new creations to transform lives. Well, Boyce, the, uh, the groups that we've been taking have predominantly been groups of 10 or 12 believers, people from up here that have heard about the Waurani or want to see missions from a genuine um, viewpoint, going and living with indigenous peoples. and. Uh, so the Waurani have built a village, a Stone Age village, out in the middle of the jungles, um, near a village, but not right in one of their own villages, where they can host people coming down. But a few months ago, a, um, a man from Seattle, Washington, called me and said that every year, for the last 17 years, he's taken a group of students from um, Western Washington University and University of Washington um, to introduce them to Ecuador, especially the jungles. And uh, the place that they'd been going, they couldn't go this year, and they wondered if the Waurani, if I would do a tour for them. Now, all the other groups have been predominantly believers, and this group was just a secular group. I didn't know who they were. But I asked the Waurani, and they said, yes, bring them. And I told them it's a big group, and I said, these, these people don't know God's trail. and they. They said, one of the women, older women said, I, I say, tell them to come and we'll show them God's trail. So, I, uh, with some misgivings, I said, all right, we'll do it. And uh, so we agreed to take 34 students and, and staff, chaperones, into the jungles. It, we took them in overland, walking on the trail, um, and then I shuttled them by plane from one little airstrip over to another one, and then put them in dugout canoes. and. At any rate, 
by the time they got down to this little camp, this little village that we had built to host tours, they had already been with the Waurani for um, several days. And uh, when we got to the camp, uh, one of the girls that first night that we were there and I had, I had flown in with some of the supplies and we were sitting around and one of the girls said, you know, we had some required reading when we came down here. And she said, in some of the things that we read, we read that these people used to be really violent. And she said, now, were those distant relatives of these people? And I said, no, those are these people. And she just said, I don't believe it. And I mean, she wasn't saying, I can't believe that. She was really saying, I don't believe it. They had been with these people and seen how gentle and kind they were. And I said, well, if I told you, if I told you, you probably still wouldn't believe it, so why don't you ask them? And she said, well, how do I ask them? How would I ask that? And I said, pick somebody and ask them where their father is. So she picked one of the men and I said, uh, where's your father? Bito Mempo Ayamonui. And he said, Dube uh, Wendapa, he's, he's already dead a long time ago. And then I said, oh, did he get sick and die? And he said, no, like, oh, you know better than that. And then he, he showed, he said he was speared. Tanonanipa uh, Wendapa, with spearing he died. And, uh, you know, the kids kind of looked at each other and said, whoa. And I said, pick somebody else. So somebody else picked one of the adults and same answer, and then same answer again. And then finally they picked Ompora, Minkai's wife. Minkai was one of the men who killed Dad and the others. And when they asked his wife, she pointed at one of the men that was standing right there with us in the little huddle that was living there with them. She said, he killed my father and my mother and my brother. And she, she went on through the family. She said, hating, hating and angry, he killed my family. And one of the boys said, my God, I was just sitting with him. I mean, just suddenly realizing, hey, this man that I've just been sitting and, you know, trying to communicate with by sign, like this, this man is a killer. And another boy said, wow, we're four for four. And then Dawa, Kimo's wife, Kimo's one of the men that uh, baptized me, and she was the one that shook her finger in my face and said, Babe, you're not listening. We say, come live with us. What do you say? She didn't wait for them to ask her. She just thought, oh, they want to know everybody who's father. So she said, he killed, my fa he killed my father and my mother who was nursing my baby sister, speared them right to the ground and my two brothers and my grandmother. And Kimo, her husband, who she said had killed her family, was sitting by me. And these kids, I mean, one of the boys said, man, I've heard enough about killing. I don't like this. I don't like talking about this anymore. I mean, this was, it was really frightening, these kids. And they didn't know who I was or what my relationship was with the tribe, so I put my arm around Kimo and I said, he killed my father too. That's six for six. Now do you believe that these people were violent? And I mean, the, these kids just could not reconcile that these people that they had been living with who were so kind and gentle and caring for them had lived lives like that. And then Dawa said, I'll tell you. I mean, she initiated. She said, I'll tell you why we don't kill anymore. Because one of the other kids said, are we in danger? And I said, let's ask Dawa. And we asked Dawa, and Dawa laughed. And she said, if we didn't know God's trail, if we weren't walking God's trail, you wouldn't wake up tomorrow. But then she went on and she said, when we lived in the old ways, we lived like animals, hating each other and fleeing from each other, killing outsiders killing our babies and, and throwing them away in the forest. And she said, but when we started walking God's trail, loving each other and in peace we live. And she said, you can walk God's trail too. And then she said to the students, all by then gathered around, it had gotten dark on the edge of the river, and she said, Baba, I asked them if they're, if they're hearing me well. I asked them if they understand what I'm saying. And I asked the kids, and there was a murmur of, of assent. Yes, they knew what she was saying. And then she said, I say, which one of you will follow God's trail? And it's just stone silence. And then one little girl, one young girl, sitting by me, college student, raised her hand. And Dao immediately clapped her hands together. And she said, Biti miti wa bopa, I see you well now. 
And then she went on, she said, the day after tomorrow, when you leave, I still dying will see you again in God's place. And then she looked at the other kids and she said, you think well on what I've said. There are many trails in life, but only one trail leads to God's place. And I say, if you want to go to God's place with me, then you must walk God's trail. And you know what? Those young people that probably wouldn't have listened to you or me were deeply impressed and affected by Dawa because I think for a lot of them, in the first time in their life, they came face to face with the realization that to be a Christian is not to adopt a code of conduct. Oh, that's part of the trappings, but that isn't Christianity. Christianity is to adopt a Savior and to be adopted into His family, to make Him Lord of our lives, and then to follow His trail, like the Wawarani say. It's, it's to forsake all the other trails and follow His trail to heaven. Steve, we're out of time. I'm going to ask you to look someone right in the eye and invite them to follow God's trail. In the years that I've followed the Lord myself, I think the realization that is most fundamental in following the Lord is that God doesn't want special people of super talent or special circumstances or special experiences. What he wants is common, ordinary men and women of uncommon commitment. Tony Campalo years ago said that commitment is the essence of identity. And I really think that that's God's call in our lives is to accept him, make him Savior, to commit our whole being to him and then to trust him to make something significant out of us. And I think that that's the uh, story of or what we call the Alka story. It isn't five heroes that went in to save a group of Stone Age savages. It's a story of five ordinary common men from this world and six common men from that world that God brought together to shake up a world and remind a lot of us, primarily here in North America, that he loves us and cares about us and that in his economy, he has chosen to work his will through us if we'll just commit ourselves to him.